Um, greetings, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Uh, this is Tim White speaking to you from Penn State. I'm the director of the Critical Zone Observatory National Office for the rest of the life of the CZOs, which ends in, no in November. And thank you for joining us for the second in our spring 2020 webinar series. The webinar series is focused on the results of CZO science, particularly that science that's societally relevant towards environmental sustainability. And today's speaker is Roger Bales from UC Merced. Just briefly say about Roger that he, he got a bachelor's degree from Purdue and I learned two master's degrees, one from UC Berkeley and one from Caltech, where he also got his PhD at Caltech. He's a distinguished professor of engineering. And what I, when I think of Roger, I think of his expertise in hydrology and climate change impacts on water resources. I know he also works quite a bit on snow, snow and ice. Really importantly for this community's interests is that He's been the PI for the Southern Sierra CZO since the inception of the program. So Roger was one of the three first PIs in the CZO program beginning in 2007. The title of his talk today is Predicting Mountain Ecosystem Response to Disturbance Through Scaling Subsurface Water Storage Capacity. And before I turn it over to Roger, I just want to say also that Roger and his team have great strengths, uh, not just in the research and science, but, but in outreach and communication with a wide array of people, including policy and decision makers in the state of California. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. And I'm really, really happy to have a chance to listen to what you have to tell us. Hey, Tim, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I, I appreciate you as a colleague all through this uh, critical zone observatory ad, ad journey. I, I think we in the critical zone community have a, a lot to celebrate on Earth Day in terms of our contributions toward, toward uh, societal uh, sustainability. And I hope that uh, what I say today is, is, stands out as just one example of what we as a, as a community have been able to accomplish and uh, we can accomplish a, a lot more. So I, uh, I'll pose this question at the beginning and try to cycle back. Can relevant critical zone science help lead politics toward the earth? And this is a sort of a takeoff from Bruno Latour who uh, some of you have read or uh, met him uh, who talks about moving politics away from nationalism or globalism and, and toward the earth because we need to take care of the earth which we depend on for our livelihoods, resources, and, and uh, basically everything. So Tim mentioned my title. Uh, this, uh, this photo is from one of our CZO sites in the in the Southern Sierra and it's, this experiment was imposed upon us a, a, a massive drought which had uh, resulted in about a hundred percent conifer mortality at one of our sites. So today I'm going to uh, touch on five, five uh, points and I'll try to bring them together at the end. One is uh, closing the water balance at uh, a couple of, of scales gives us some insight into critical zone processes, and particularly uh, regolith water storage, which is essential. Storage, multi-year storage, has got to be uh, one uh, attribute that we depend on for managing these ecosystems, uh, because we need to know: Do we have too much vegetation to withstand a drought, and things like that? and how we've scaled that across the Sierra Nevada, and, and how that plays into forest disturbance, be it through management or wildfire or, or drought, and then come back to societal uh, decisions. So let me start with the water, 
a little bit of science on the, on the water balance from our uh, CZO work. This is the only equation I have in this, I think the only equation I have in the, the talk today, uh, just a basic water balance uh, that uh, we're looking at how precipitation partitions between evapotranspiration runoff or I should say precipitation and, and storage change uh, supports uh, evapotranspiration and runoff. There are places where we have measured this across the uh, landscape. In terms of science questions, uh, what I'll present today really addresses these questions. Um, we had this tree mortality and we asked, is this a new pattern or is this just part of a natural cycle? And well, the, the answer is it's not really part of a natural cycle. It's a new pattern that is the result of both climate warming and a century of fire suppression giving us overstocked forests in the Sierra Nevada and other parts of the Western US. <clears throat> Second question, how, how, does, how do forest density, regolith, water storage, that is water storage in the soil and, and weathered bedrock, and other factors buffer drought? Well, the, the short answer is, is multi-year storage uh, and how much multi-year storage we have is an index of the drought buffer and I'll come back to that index, how that quantitative index. And then the management question, what are sustainable forest densities and how do we get there? So I'm not gonna answer that question ecologically but try to bring some of our uh, critical zone work uh, that's relevant to, to addressing that question in into today's talk many of you have uh, some of you are on the on on the uh online today have been to our southern sierra czo i'm going to use data from um not just our focal site which is near the rain snow transition in the sierra nevada the third circle up on on this map or this uh, satellite image but but we have a transect of eddy covariance towers and other uh, soil moisture and other other uh, critical zone measurements along this transect and from that uh, from sampling this steep elevation and ecological transect uh, we've we've tried to put pieces together uh, that we can uh, learn over over large learn processes over larger areas eddy covariance towers we have tall trees, so yeah, the, this tower at our one of our sites is about 55 meters tall because we have uh, have tall tall trees, and we we measure the exchange of water and carbon dioxide uh, between the canopy and the atmosphere. <clears throat> so let me go to some uh, results. Uh, the experiment was four years of hot drought. What? How did this perturb the the system, and again, going to a water balance. Uh, this is, these are measurements from one of our sites. Uh, below the line going down is the evapotranspiration amount on an annual basis for drought started in fall of 2011. It was a wet year in 11, then there were four years of low precipitation, and then 2016 was more of an average year of precipitation. So we can see as we look above the line, those bars are pretty small during the drought, but that's runoff Q. Uh, but below the line, you can see evapotranspiration also dropped off a little during the drought. And of course, the total height of the bar would be precipitation uh, with a little bit of red sliver there that's change in storage. Uh, um, that is, there was some subsurface storage used to satisfy evapotranspiration, over year subsurface storage used to satisfy evapotranspiration, based on our water balance from um, the, the, where the, we had measuring all these things at, at the site. And that's borne out by the matrix potential, which shows seasonal recovery of matrix potential during the first few years of the drought, but not during the last year of the drought. This is, I think, uh, two meter matrix potential there. And our soil moisture measurements showed basically the same thing. So these forests are basically at this location survived the drought. This is not a, from the site from the picture on my earlier slide. These, these survived the drought by going uh, to 
draw on over year subsurface storage. Now, um, let's look at that lower elevation site where there was um, ma massive tree mortality. Notice that evapotranspiration dropped off a lot. That's because the trees were shutting down. Matrix potential didn't recover after the first year of the drought. The, the evaporative demand was quite high here. In terms of the water balance, the Q term is, was zero. <laughs> there as you can see from the, the data. And withdrawal from subsurface storage declined over time as the subsurface water was depleted because it wasn't replenished by precipitation on a year-to-year -year basis. So this, this uh, water balance at this scale basically told us that reduced precipitation caused trees to deplete the water stored and thus uh, they became susceptible to uh, attack by bark beetle and other, other pests. And, and we basically had 100% conifer uh, mortality there. So that was, a, that was a, a nice story from a science standpoint, not a nice story from a, a forest health standpoint. <clears throat> but a, an indication that yeah, we're not taking very good care of our, of our landscapes. So let me talk a little bit about, plunge in a little deeper on this measuring the, the regolith water storage, how we did it. I've shown some results, but let me go to now some of the measurements. We had these in situ measurements. I mentioned the eddy covariance. Uh, we we uh, did some drilling of cores down to bedrock to uh, map the, uh, the regolith, uh, soil pits, uh, soil moisture measurements, and, and so forth. Then the, the remote sensing and modeling effort uh, uh, is is how we scale the evapotranspiration and then there was um, colleagues uh, did some geophysical uh, uh, investigations using using mainly seismic to uh, determine uh, some of the subsurface properties particularly uh, uh, porosity so in terms of the uh, critical zone architecture this is uh, our one of our, our cartoons of that uh, mapped soil uh, which you would you can you know get from statsco and other databases like that and then the weathered uh, you know sap rock and then uh, you know, fractured bedrock and so forth so from um, things like the uh, uh, drilling and the uh, seismic measurements, we can get a total porosity. And, and I think this is for the top four, four meters or so, which we were, were trying to look at the root accessible water for these uh, trees. So this is a capacity, total porosity, but the available water storage, which is not the full porosities available, so, so you can you know, do, um, you know, lab, lab studies and so forth to get the available water storage. And that came out to about 1400 millimeters. When we did those calculations for plant accessible water, that also came out to about 1400 millimeters. So we were pleased uh, with this map, with this map that is plant accessible water is actually how much water the, uh, the forest actually, actually used. <clears throat> then, uh, dry season available water, that, that's the mean for that time period. So let me uh, you know, go to the, the next graph and, and dry season uh, drawdown. Um, so looking at those two on a time series, we started with about 1400 millimeters of plant accessible water at the beginning of the drought. This is the, at the 1100 meter elevation pine oak forest where there was the, the pines, uh, the uh, conifers, died and the oaks were able to survive. And we see that the available water decreased over time because the drawdown during the dry season, uh, here in California, we have a Mediterranean climate, so wet winters, dry summers, uh, forests always depend on the uh, subsurface waters to get through the six month or so dry season, uh, which, which starts in, 
uh, spring, some sometime in spring, and and lasts until new precipitation in the fall, typically October and November. So dry season drawdown and was gradually depleting the available water at this site. These are measurements at the, at the site in the ground, uh, verified uh, of the from the flux tower uh, water balance uh, of evapotranspiration. So you can see that there was no additional drawdown during the last two years of the drought because there wasn't any water left, basically, other than what precipitation occurred uh, in, in the uh, upper part of, and, and was stored in the upper part of the, uh, of the weathered, uh, of the saffron and soil. So that, that gave us some, a nice capacity factors at, at these sites. Uh, and then, so let me move on to how we, it's nice to know that at one site, or each of those four sites where we have intensive measurements, but we actually, we wanna know it everywhere in the Sierra Nevada. So how do we get to that? So let's look at scaling this and put it in the context of drought vulnerability. We learned something about drought vulnerability at at these sites. Uh, so our scaling model, and I'm not giving the equation here, but the line is the, basically the model. We, we found uh, from Mike Golden's paper in 2014 and, and several papers since then, uh, we've, we've published this correlation between annual evapotranspiration measured at eddy covariance tower sites in California and uh, annual mean NDVI from either MODIS or Landsat uh, satellite. This is from our, one of our earlier papers. Our later papers have more years of, of data in them, but still the same sort of uh, cor correlation. Uh, so this, this then enable, gives us uh, a method based on the calibration from these eddy covariance tower sites, which includes the four I showed you, plus some other uh, sites that, that Mike has in Southern California, and we've pulled in some other data from other investigators uh, also. This gives us a way then to take satellite NDVI and calculate evapotranspiration for every place across the landscape using either uh, MODIS or, or Landsat. Uh, data. So here's an example from 2010. This is a Landsat uh, false color, uh, somewhat fa false color Landsat uh, image in the upper left. Our, um, our measurement sites spanned from the lower elevation Oak Savannah up through the uh, up through the mixed conifer to the uh, toward the high Sierra. Down here in the, the, you can see the agricultural areas in, in the valley, we, we weren't working there, but up here in, in this uh, uh, river basin, the outline is for the Kings River Basin in the Southern Sierra, so Fresno would be in the sort of middle center, left middle center, of the, uh, off to the left of the picture, or off to the left of center in the picture. So using that relationship on the previous slide, then we can calculate annual evapotranspiration. And that's what we get here uh, in the uh, lower right uh, image where the dark blue is this sort of happy zone for trees where it's not too cold and it's not too dry. There's plenty of precipitation. So evapotranspiration can approach a, a meter per year in that area. In the higher elevations, it's shut down in the winter, it's colder. In the lower elevations, it's water limited. So that that I, I think there's a there's a good physical um, rationale for using this a greenness index for uh, a uh, for an estimate of evapotranspiration. In later work, we've brought in some additional variables, but uh, but still uh, you know, this this is a uh, I think. A, as, as sufficient in many cases, depending on how far you're trying to extrapolate the data. 
So we, we, if you bring in precipitation, uh, you'll get a little bit better uh, fit to the, to the data as an additional variable, although you deal with, uh, with correlation. <laughs> so then let me go to spend a little time on this, this result. So let's look at this left panel, which is cumulative P minus ET. And this is for the period of during the drought. <clears throat> so this is, these are annual values. The, what I'm showing here is the Sierra Nevada, but instead of an XY graph, it's a latitude versus elevation. So lower elevations would be on the left and the high Sierra on, on the right as you go up, uphill. And the color bar is for cumulative P minus ET. That is cumulative um, negative values means that evapotranspiration was greater than ET during this uh, four year period. So you can see the yellow colors are green to yellow colors are negative values and the bluer colors are positive values. So positive values means there was an excess of precipitation, meaning that's where we got runoff. The negative values means there probably wasn't any runoff unless it was a big intense event, uh, precipitation event, but rather all the water went for um, evapotranspiration and the negative values were either supplied by over year subsurface storage or else the trees ran out of water. And in fact, the trees ran out of water. Uh, you see some gaps in the data here. That's like the rim fire in the middle. So we, we cut out areas where there was wildfire. We compare that to an index of tree mortality from satellite uh, uh, NDMI, the change in NDMI over that period. And we can see that that's where there was uh, stress, water stress in these yellower uh, areas. And there's a reasonable correlation between those, which I'll, I'll show you that correlation and then go back. But, um, you know, P on the right hand panel here, our cumulative P minus ET versus the change in NDMI. They, they're, I think that's a, a pretty good uh, mapping of that. So let's go a little further here to the right hand panel. The US Forest Service does aerial surveys of dead trees. And that also has a good correlation with the panels uh, on, on the left. I'll go back to that here on the, on the uh, left hand graph, delta NDMI, dead trees per hectare, P minus ET, dead trees per hectare. Not perfect, but still it's a correlation. And I think if we did a little more work subsetting the data and so forth, we could come out with, with, uh, with, something, with something a little uh, more robust. But now that, in fact, gives us a, predict a predictability for future droughts. We can build drought scenarios either from historical data, from climate modeling, and we're actually working on that because we precipitation and ET are state variables to, you know, to think about so we can calculate what sort of design drought do we want to aim for and what does that, what's that going to do in terms of moisture stress and what may it do in terms of uh, tree mortality. So this is one of these relevant metrics that resource managers uh, can actually take home and, and use for planning uh, forest restoration. They'll say, okay, we know the forest is overstocked. Does that mean we have to remove 50% of the biomass or 75% of the biomass? And yes, those are the numbers that we're talking about here in the Sierra Nevada. It's really overstocked. And um, so cumulative P minus CT then gives us a quantitative predictor. And I would say it improves upon some of the traditional drought indices if we look at just delta NDMI versus standard precipitation index, uh, standard evap precipitation evapotranspiration index or PDSI, okay, PDSI is probably the best uh, fit there, you know, but none of them are, are as good as the uh, 
P minus ET. So we think that P minus ET is, at least for these forests, better than using these more agricultural based uh, indices that are, are, are widely, widely used and, and we're trying to bring that into, into use for uh, resource management here, the, the cumulative P minus ET as an index of drought. Okay, uh, let me shift again. So I've, I've talked about you know, how, how we close the water balance, we verified that with regular storage measurements. We've scaled it across the landscape, use that to assess drought and vulnerability. Now let's go into a little bit of, of uh, forest disturbance and how that relates to forest disturbance. This photo is actually one of the areas where uh, the, bio, uh, the, the landowner, it happens to be a, a uh, a private landowner, but it's a, it's a nonprofit uh, conservation group, uh, has removed about half of the trees. They didn't actually haul them out, they masticated them and they're still on the ground. So the fire risk is, is still a little bit higher than, uh, than you would like. Uh, the issue here is hot fire will kill all the trees. Uh, and there's enough fuel here to still give a pretty hot fire. What it may not uh, do is get up in the canopy because uh, they've removed the ladder fuels that would, uh, so a ground fire might not get up into the canopy here. So this has been thinned and yeah, this costs real money. They probably paid $1,500 an acre to have this thinning done. There's only 8 million acres in California that's in need of, of immediate thinning. So you do the math. So let's you know, go back to this model that we have here and look at what is the change in evapotranspiration when there's forest disturbance, be it through wildfire or management and so forth. So let's look at another uh, management uh, project. This is a uh, an aerial view of the uh, uh, Central Sierra project where thinning was done in 2011. You can see the control areas is this overly dense closed canopy forest. When you remove about half the biomass, you open up the canopy. Variable means you aim for some large, large patches uh, where sunlight can get in. Uh, even means you try to remove every other tree and you don't have these large heterogene heterogeneity. The heterogeneity is more of, the, of what the forest was 100 to 150 years ago. So in sites like this then, uh, where we have really fairly accurate data, we can look at, uh, you know, verify uh, what we're doing with our, uh, with our satellite index in terms of measurements on the ground. But I'm, what I'm showing here is just the NDVI over time from the beginning of the Landsat era, over time for aggregated of the control plots, the evenly thin plots, and the variable thin plots. And you can just say thin because they, they're basically, they track each other. So over time, they track each other pretty well. Then the thinning was done. We had a wet year and the uh, control had higher evapotranspiration, but because of the thinning, the, the, the ones that with trees removed had lower. So we can get a number of about 150 to 200 millimeter per year drop in evapotranspiration uh, in, in these, uh, during this uh, immediate um, post thinning period. And this looks like about four years post thinning. Now, when we, Look at wildfire. I'll, I'll zoom in a little on some specific fires, but this is a Sierra Nevada wide calculation that uh, former postdoc, now assistant uh, professor at uh, Christine Ma, who's an assistant professor at Mississippi State in forestry now, um, is, uh, did uh, looking at annual forest water use uh, across the Sierra Nevada. And here she just shows the um, impact of wildfire. So she's showing five years pre-fire and she stacked up 
even though the fires are in different years, she stacked them up all to year zero being the year the fire occurred. So using Landsat data and this uh, model that, uh, of the uh, NDVI and versus ET, she's showing the immediate drop first year post drought for high severity versus low intensity wildfire. And then how quickly does it grow back in terms of the, uh, the recovery of ET? It, after 15 years, it may not recover to pre-fire values, but, but close, because uh, you may not be getting the same vegetation go, uh, coming back. So this can also then inform, well, if we want to maintain a certain biomass, how often do we have to go back and repeat these uh, treatments? Because the wildfire is a proxy for, uh, for management treatments. It's basically removal of, of, of biomass. So you say, well, there's a lot of variability and so forth there. Yeah, that's true. But this is, this is a broad average. But you, and you can see a remarkable consistency in the data despite the variability over elevation and latitude and precipitation and so forth. But let's go to more of a, a, a case study here on, on, uh, in the central Sierra where we've done some quite a bit of scaling work and we have quite a bit of data. The American River Basin, I'm gonna focus on it. So Sacramento is down here to the left, Lake Tahoe up here on the right. Uh, these yellow polygons are large, are, are the wildfires that have occurred during the Landsat period uh, where we have data for them. This, especially this huge rim fire, which was what, 2016 or 17, I'll, I come, I'll come back to that. Uh, so let's look at what was the change in water balance with these, uh, with these large, large fires. And this is a very important basin because it's, it's an important water supply. It has a huge amount of hydropower in the basin. There's a lot of expensive infrastructure out there. And unfortunately, a lot of people live out in the, out in the forest, in the basin here. And so there's a lot of uh, you know, homes and businesses and towns that are susceptible to wildfire. You've probably heard about the Paradise Fire. That was a little further north uh, in here. Um, but the same thing could happen here. So OK, elevation averaged water balance across the American River. We, PRISM data we use for precipitation, so precipitation from PRISM data. This is 1,000 millimeters per year versus elevation going from low to high, left to right. Evapotranspiration from our model, again, this sort of happy zone for trees where it's not too cold and not too dry. Colder at the higher elevation, uh, less precipitation at the lower elevation. And then the difference between them gives runoff. So this is a long-term average. Uh, so, uh, so for long-term average, delta S is zero. <clears throat> and then I, so I just wanted to orient you to this basin. Uh, so that, you know, then we have how much of the percent of the total basin area. So it's, it has quite a, a range of uh, elevations for basin area, but the runoff comes mainly in the higher elevations. Uh, you know, the, the snow line is going to be, let's see, I think I have that here. Yeah, so more of the runoff comes from the snow zone, less from the rain zone. So um, this is this this will this will play this will play into what what is our benefit when we do forest management. Now, looking at this in terms of a map, an average year, I have three. I have an average year going from left to right for precipitation evapotranspiration, and the difference between them. I just wanted to point out that precipitation is pretty variable. We can see that precipitation varies by uh, you know, a factor of two or, or more as we go from an, a wet year to a dry year. Evapotranspiration, however, doesn't vary as much. And you remember that also from the, from the first graph bar chart I showed you of uh, flux tower measured of apple transpiration. And then the difference is P minus ET. So that P minus ET is hugely amplified by the fact that precipitation is variable, evapotranspiration transpiration is not very variable. So we get even more uh, vari interannual variability. And uh, 
yeah, just note, these are some of the fire in the lower panel for the dry year, uh, which is 2015, uh, yeah. Okay, so the rim fire was 2014 then. We see these, or the King fire, this big fire scar here, another big fire scar there, and so forth. They're, they're pretty distinct in the landscape. So you can say, well, let's let the Sierra Nevada burn, then we'll have more runoff. Huh? Okay, but no, we want to maintain other, we want to manage the Sierra Nevada for multi-benefit, multiple benefits. So one way to do that is to find the money to help pay for, uh, well, we, we need to find the money to help pay for forest restoration. A lot of it is federal land, uh, forest service land especially, there's some private land out there, but it's basically the public land where it's in need of restoration. So if you think Congress is gonna pay for it, well, there's stimulus bills going through right now, but I haven't seen forests mentioned in it. So you, maybe if, if um, maybe you have a higher chance of winning the lottery than getting the Sierra Nevada, uh, Congress to pay for Sierra Nevada forest restoration. So if we're gonna, engage local funders in doing this, we need to have what's called payment for ecosystem services. We need to monetize the benefits. And one benefit that we are monetizing is the change in water balance. That is, there's more runoff, more uh, when, when there is less vegetation using water in the forest. And I think most people can, you know, uh, who are scientists can can grasp the concept when I show them. So taking for the American River Basin now, uh, this is based on wildfire data across the American River uh, Basin. Year zero is when the fire occurred. So year one, there was this much reduction from about 120 to, to 260 millimeters per year reduction in ET where the actual ET is, um, you know, started out at somewhere between, I think the basin average is about 350 or 400, but it goes up to 1,000 at the most productive elevations, 1,000 millimeters per year. So, but post-fire, vegetation grows back, so the ET uh, increases. Uh, so then the question, the land manager says, aha, I have to go back after 10 years or 15 years or 20 years if they want to meet uh, you know, my, 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 my goals. Or the, the beneficiary from the hydropower agency or the water agency says, well, I'm only going to get those benefits for 10 years unless the land manager goes back in. Uh, so even though there's a large standard deviation around these lines because of variability of different elevations and so forth of these fires, on average, fire decreased ET by about 70 millimeters per year for each 25% reduction in basal area. And think of that as just proportional to biomass. And biomass is proportional to ET. So vegetation that grows after fire may be somewhat different, but it still uses water. And also from here, we see that ET recovers at about seven to nine millimeters per year. Okay, these are numbers we can use for planning. Obviously, it's, it's gonna depend on whether you have wet years or dry years and so forth, uh, post-fire. Uh, that's part of the variability, but you need some uh, planning numbers and then you can tweak them to apply for, you know, to apply different uh, climate scenarios to that. So I think these are numbers we're also using to try to plan how often do we need to go back to maintain certain benefits from the uh, forest thinning and, and forest restoration. Water managers are always asking, well, what's the net ET reduction? How much water am I getting back? This is just looking at from the wildfires across the basin uh, from the uh, Landsat period where we had uh, looking uh, look comparing pre-fire to post-fire. So at most recent year, about 81,000 acre feet per year. And that's, that's, that's real water. That's uh, water, uh, wholesale water during a drought sells for over $1,000 an acre foot. 
so this is this is real this is real money to somebody out there growing almonds or or uh, urban and so forth. So our hypothesis is that active forest management control uh, con to control fuel loads could average about five times this amount if we were actively managing the the forest in this uh, in this American River Basin. And in fact, plans are well underway to try to do that by the by the landowners there. <clears throat> so we say, well, where do we focus the management activities? So again, we apply this um, uh, you know this p minus et to historical data, and we haven't run the the uh, future scenarios yet. Maximum observed one year, how much water is used during the dry season on any given year? Well, for large areas, it it is 300 millimeters or more. Now that's well within. Remember that uh, we estimated 1,400 millimeters of plant available water at some of our sites in the Southern Sierra. We haven't done the calculate. We haven't done the detailed measurements here, but this says we're we're using you know 300 or so millimeters over uh, wide areas of the productive forest. Uh, multi during the multi recent multi-year drought, how much extra water was withdrawn? Well, again, it's 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 below 300. So this area was not drought stressed. There was a little bit of tree mortality, a little bit of moisture stress here, but not a huge amount like we had in the Southern Sierra. So drought resilience for a four year drought is good. We're, we're gonna be looking at scenarios though for more like a six year, eight year drought, because if you look at the paleoclimate record, the last 1100 years of tree ring record, you can see that there were longer droughts than just four years. A four year drought occurred about once a century. So what are we doing there? Much of the French, much of this area has dense forest. Uh, it's, it's being uh, thinned. It's, uh, it, it's just uh, overgrown, has lots of ladder fuels trying to turn it into landscape like this. So I wanna just close quickly with uh, a little a couple points on informing societal decisions. Again, borrowing a perspective from Bruno Latour and applying it to land management, we know that these days scientific facts are not objective and freestanding like we used to think about, but people view scientific knowledge as being more socially uh, produced. So a traditional view of, okay, we'll throw our facts over the fence and let people use them. No, they need to be robust and, and socialized and supported by uh, a common culture. So when we think about understanding and valuing sustainability, we think about meeting the needs of the present without compromising uh, the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So connecting, if we wanna connect the societal challenge like wild, extensive wildfire with a societal solution uh, by thinning the forest, how do critical zone research findings and science metrics, our products, fit into that? And, I, and this, this is just a Bruno Latour with our field manager out looking at trying to observe how we're doing science. Uh, so societal, society stakeholders have their own metrics though, what they want the landscape to be. So we need to bring those two together. Our science metrics with what metrics, how do they match, how do they address the needs of the stakeholders and then together we can develop evaluation and financing strategy and in this picture is stakeholders that we work with that span the political spectrum from the far left to the far right. And we're all focused on forest restoration. Then we can come up with societal solutions. And the key barrier here is, is the financing strategy. So I, I hope that as critical zone scientists, we're leading politics toward the earth through bringing our relevant uh, science, uh, science into the decision-making realm. I'll just close with some, uh, as a summary of, of key points that I've covered today. So back to the science, multiple independent measurements show plant accessible water storage to several meters depth, uh, down to at least four, four or five meters during the drought. Scaling of evapotranspiration and storage 
is the key to predicting drought vulnerability. And we, we recommend this cumulative P minus ET index for, for wildlands as, as a metric. The scaling of apotranspiration uh, gives us estimates of potential runoff, changes due to management. Those are things we can hopefully uh, take to the bank with stakeholders to predict and verify the effects of changes uh, in the sustainability of headwaters and, and natural infrastructure investments. And one final main point, socialize your science. Get it, get it out there. And I, I think Sarah can give you links to some uh, way of how we're doing that through uh, working with a uh, nonprofit filmmaker and uh, so forth. So our, our, uh, our, our 27 minute uh, film that was on this, this topic was uh, shown on PBS in California. Now it's being distributed nationwide uh, next, next month. So in terms of acknowledgments, I'd like to just uh, thank my uh, close colleague and spouse Martha Conklin and many other CZO uh, collaborators and, uh, and others. And here we have another day in the laboratory. Okay, I'll stop there, Sarah and Tim. Thanks, Roger. It was wonderful. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can um, raise your hand. I'll mute you. Uh, take advantage of the Q&A section or the chat box. Um, and we'll open it up to questions. And I've added the websites for the documentary that Roger mentioned, uh, Beyond the Brink, California's Watershed, in the chat box. If anyone would like to check that out. Roger. Oh, hi, Tim. I have a very specific question about one of the studies you mentioned, which is the one up in the American River Conservancy where they, where they removed, I think you said about half the forest. Half the and, biomass, yeah. And I'm just, I'm just curious because you described them as having masticated the wood and left, leaving it on, on the landscape. And I'm just wondering what was their rationale for doing that? Um, market value. In some cases, if, if it was closer to a road, and depending on the contract, they were able to get uh, some merchantable timber. And so over this uh, 10,000 acre restoration area, they probably treated a couple thousand, uh, a th at least a thousand acres, and they've, they've probably got, you know, a million dollars worth of revenue off of merchantable timber. It just happens in the area I showed you, they did not. They didn't feel that the t what was there was large enough because they bought this from a timber company who pulled out the good stuff about five years earlier. <laughs> so uh, some areas you can offset some of the cost, but not a whole lot of the cost. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? So yeah, in terms of revenue, we, th we think that the revenue sources coming off of here off of these thinned areas, timber is going to provide a little bit. Carbon storage uh, will provide a, a little bit in terms of uh, you know cap and trade uh, funds. Water seems to be the larger uh, potential uh, revenue source to bring in to these. So we're actually working with nonprofit company that does financing and then helps the agencies capture the benefits, uh, including. Uh, you know, hydropower agencies have bought in to help help uh, pay for some of the uh, of the of the benefits. There's a, a chat box question. Is there? Yeah. Did I did we calculate the variability from Puri Ajami? Uh, did we calculate the variability in regular storage across the uh, elevation uh, gradient? The answer is, uh, yeah, that's uh, that was that that we did, and uh, I, I didn't sum it by elevation gradient, but that's that's uh, I, I went over it pretty quickly. But uh, this is this uh, maximum water deficit is a lower limit 
so the trees didn't die here. So we, we don't know what the actual storage is, but it's a, this provides us at least a lower limit. Down in the Southern Sierra where the trees did die, we think those are good numbers for what the regular storage actually is because if there was more water, the trees would have used it <laughs> and, and, they, and they didn't. So that we, we, we use this method to, uh, to estimate regolith water storage and, it's, and, and uh, we wish we had the funds and maybe we will in the future to, to do some, uh, some more on the ground uh, estimates to, to help scale that. Okay, there's a, uh, okay, uh, from Jesse. Um, okay, so thanks. I'm curious to find if there's a potential side effect of increased summer temperatures that might accompany decreased evapotranspiration because increased energy is not being used up by latent heat during evapotranspiration. Is that significant? So a very, uh, you know, a, a very open question we're dealing with now as you look out longer planning is, will water use efficiency change with increased carbon dioxide? And in, in our models, we're assuming that is not going to offset the warmer temperatures. And I think, you know, there was a recent science paper uh, where there was strongly questioning if water use you know, efficiency is going to offset. We're dealing with hot droughts now. This most recent drought was a couple of degrees warmer than the previous drought in the late 80s and early 90s. And even though the previous one was six years, it did not have anywhere near the effect that this hot drought uh, did. So yes, in our uh, 2018 paper, we show that the evapotranspiration basically uh, increased with temperature across the two main flux tower sites in the forest just based on the theoretical curve. <laughs> so we're using, we're using that. And when we, when we do larger scale modeling, we try to dial down the water use efficiency that ecologists have put into those models. I'd be really interested to note if other people are dealing with this uh, in, in terms of the, uh, in terms of scenarios for future uh, evapotranspiration and thus uh, drawing upon subsurface storage and so forth. <clears throat> I don't know if that answered your question, Jesse, but you can you can ask it again. Uh, so we're, we're basically saying there's a negative feedback uh, there with with temperature on the on the, on the resilience, which gets us to the management point that. Um, historical forest densities measured in 1911 may not be a good index for sustainability in the Sierra Nevada going forward. We may have to somehow go to lower biomass densities if we want to keep the fuel load down to, for, for both wildfire, because wildfire in the, in the Sierra Nevada depends on fuel load and temperature, and fuel load is what we can, uh, what we can change, but also drought resilience. We have to go to lower numbers if we want to have more drought uh, resilience than historical. That creates problems for other benefits because habitat depends on dense forests. We've already put roads and clearings and everything else through the forest and, and endangered species and other habitat need, need dense forests, but yet it's gonna burn or trees are gonna die if we don't remove some of it. So it, 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 it's a challenge to balance those benefits. Any other questions? Well, I'd be happy to, to continue any uh, discussion that people want to bring up. I did uh, post these slides on my uh, on my homepage, and uh, we have this uh, this last work in the American Rivers in a a paper that I doing hopefully what's final revisions for the uh, journals Frontiers and Forest 
something or other. I keep forgetting the names of these new journals. Uh, yeah. yeah. And you can check out Roger's website. It was rogerbales.com, correct? Um, well, thanks, Roger. If nobody else has any more questions, our next two webinars are May 6th and May 22nd. So please check those out. And um, talk. thank you, Roger. Happy Earth, happy Earth Day again. <laughs> thanks, Roger. Happy Earth Day. <laughs>